So here's the disruptive idea. What if we could change the code and the model together for no more cost than the current cost of changing just the code, maybe even less? So this, simplifying wildly, is the idea of model-driven development. So MDD means different things to different people. And indeed, you'll see there's a whole bunch of different um, related acronyms that all mean subtly different things. I, you'll also hear me say MDE quite a lot, Model Driven Engineering. Um, anyway, Model Driven Development treats models as important first class artifacts in development. Um, except that a large development may in involve many models, um, which may each be adapted to the needs of their users. So you might have a design model, a database model, an architecture model, you might have a user interaction model. Um, and because anything's a model, um, you can also regard the code as a model and the documentation as a model and so on. Um, Model-driven development uses tools to avoid duplicating work. Okay, So we try to um, only have to um, enter a decision into the set of artifacts in a software development once, or for short, write once, um, so that decisions that are recorded in one model can be automatically rolled through to any other relevant models, including the code. How do we do that? Model transformations. What's a model transformation? Well, it's just a program. Okay, It's a program that can create or modify a model, and typically it does that using information from one or more other models. Um, that's not surprising because anything's a model. Okay, But we're often thinking here about sort of graphical design models um, or maybe textual models. Okay. So some examples of model transformations that you already know about, um, code generators where we might, for example, input a UML model and output some Java code. And it might be complete Java code, or it might be skeleton code, you know, depending on um, how much information you put in and how clever your code generator is. Um, you've also met things like Javadoc. Those are model transformations too. Um, they input something or other, might be some Java code, um, and they output some documentation. Um, a more sophisticated task, and it more interesting for our purposes to today, um, is something like round-trip engineering. So if you input a, both a UML model and some Java code, and what you want to do is to change either one or both of them so that they are consistent, um, then you're doing round-trip engineering. And then we're really in the world where it's possible to um, make a change in just one place and have it rolled through to the other places. So the ideal is, um, your UML model and your Java code are always up to date, and you say, um, okay, so I don't know, maybe I want to change the name of a class. Okay, and I can either do it in the Java and press a button and have the UML model's name updated, or I can do it in the UML model and press a button and have that name updated throughout the Java code in all the relevant places there. Um, now, in that particular case, if all you're trying to do is to change a name, you've got a decent chance that it's going to work with the available tools. Um, but the available tools for this tend to be quite fragile and unpredictable because actually this is quite hard. Um, it's an active research area. Um, I'm not going to say very much more about it. Um, one of the reasons why it's hard is because there is usually more than one way to bring two things back into consistency. Um, so if you say, I've made a change to the UML model, it requires some kind of change to the Java code, usually there are many different ways you could change the code to bring it back into consistency with the UML model. Some of them will be better than others. The choice of which way to do it somehow has to be embodied in the transformation process, and this all gets very delicate very fast. Now, in the very early days of model-driven development, um, what we had was um, what the OMG, the Object Management Group, called model-driven architecture. And this is the diagram that they were using in the early days. It comes from a document um, dates back to 2007. Um, and the way they were telling the story was that you would have a, a PIM, that's a platform independent model, um, written in a, in a language defined um, by a platform independent meta model in the kind of way that, we, that we've discussed. Um, and it would be automatically transformed into a platform specific model um, in fact, probably into more than one platform-specific model for different platforms. That was how you were going to change effort. You were going to save effort 
um, by having your one platform independent model and transforming it into specific models for all the different platforms you had to support. And there would be a transformation um, that would be written in terms of the, the meta models that described the languages of those two different models um, that would specify how to do this. Essentially, it doesn't work. Um, why doesn't it work? Well, there's a number of different reasons. Um, a big part is that um, in the original vis vision where you might use a general purpose language like UML for expressing those models, um, those languages are much too complex um, and they have much too much in the way of kind of fuzzy, ill-defined semantics in corners of them um, for it to be really practical to define fully automatic transformations. It turns out that, that that's just, you know, much too hard work. Um, and there are two possible responses to that. Um, one is to say, well, let's do that kind of thing, but with much simpler languages. So, for example, we might use the kinds of simple domain-specific modeling languages that we've talked about um, and then say, well, now those languages are simple enough that it does make sense to have fully automated transformations going between them. The other thing you can do is to accept that those transformations will not be fully automatic. You won't get your, your platform-specific model completely generated from the platform information independent model. Um, but instead, um, people will somehow be enabled to make the de decisions at the most appropriate level and will use bidirectional transformations to roll the effects of their decisions through to other effective models, maintaining consistency between the two models. So there might have to be some manual work, um, but not too much. So any, any, any piece of manual work will only have to be done in one place. So neither of these is a, is a solved problem. Um, we've already talked about domain-specific languages a bit, and now we're going to spend some time talking about bidirectional transformations as a means of maintaining consistency between models. So why are bidirectional transformations important? So you can see all of the advances that we've made in software engineering well, back as long as there's been software engineering, back to the 1960s, as being about us getting better at separating concerns. And in the context of modelling, that means separating the decision-making that goes into developing software into different models. So we have various different models, each one adapted to the needs of the people who are going to use it. But as soon as you have separated concerns, um, you also have to worry about how you're ever going to reintegrate them. In other words, how are you going to maintain consistency between those models um, when any of the models might be the place where a particular decision um, is recorded. I mean, usually for a given decision, there'll be one place where it's sensible to record it. Um, maintaining consistency between these models, um, and remember that code is a model as well, um, is the job of a bidirectional transformation. Now, interestingly, um, when OMG put out a request for proposals um, for a language in which to express transformations, such as the ones they were envisaging in the, in the MDA vision, um, the, um, there's a there's a, a very interesting document that records um, some input that they got from users about what the requirements on that language ought to be, and bidirectionality, this ability to um, not just completely generate one model from another, but do the more complicated task of maintaining consistency between models, um, was high up in the users' requirements list, but it didn't make it through as a compulsory feature um, of the um, the actual proposals for a transformation language and so we ended up in a kind of um, in a kind of intermediate state partly I think because people already understood that bidirectionality is difficult and that designing bidirectional languages is not a solved problem so let's get a bit more concrete about what's going on here and why we need bidirectionality so we talked about having um, separated concerns and having different models at, I, in use in the same software development, each adapted to the need of different people using it. So in terms of the OMG MDA, um, typically we might have one team working on the platform independent model and maybe a product team on each platform specific model. And you, the way you have to think about it is that each team has considerable expertise in their model but not in all the other models that are in use in the software project. Um, and because different 
models are expressed in different modeling languages, it may even be that they are only experts in the language of their model and they can't even read somebody else's model efficiently even if they want to. And so if the product team discovers in the course of, of writing the code that their, um, that their product specific model um, is not quite right in a way which has an effect on the uh, platform independent model. Um, we want it to be easy for them to make a change in, in the model that they understand, in the PSM, and then cause any necessary change to be made to the PIM automatically. Um, now we want that for several reasons. Um, it might be that the issue they've spotted also has implications for other PSM teams who ought to be informed about it, in which case going via the PIM is how we do it. Um, and also, if the models are to continue to be useful for deployment and for maintenance and so on, then you don't want them getting out of date. You don't want to be in a situation where there is a PIM, but actually it doesn't record the fact that um, the PSM that was generated from it then had to be changed perhaps in quite a radical way because it turned out to be not suitable for purpose. Okay, You'd like everything to be consistent at the end of the day. And this is one reason why you don't just want the PSM generated as a one-off from the PIM. You also want to be able to say, now we've changed the PSM, can we please change the PIM to bring it back into consistency? And of course from the point of view of the other PSM teams, if they had their PSM generated from the PIM as it was to start with, and now the PIM has changed because of this um, problem with it that was discovered by the first team, now they would like to have their PSM updated for that change without losing all the work they did on their PSM. Okay? So consistency maintenance is a, is a big deal here. Here is a, a slightly more updated view of the OMG's MDA. Um, and it's not that different from the original view that I showed you, except that we've got this mysterious backward arrow coming up here. And this basically represents a realization that um, sometimes things will have to affect the PIM um, because of discoveries that are made later. That's really the only point I want to make with that diagram there. It's a bit like in the waterfall model where you start to see these backwards arrows that take you back up the way up the waterfall in recognition that it's not possible to complete one, t one uh, development activity before you even begin the next. Um, but sometimes kind of there's a, 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 a lot of devil in the detail of what do we actually mean by this backward arrow and this is very much how it is here. So. Let's get a bit more concrete about what a bidirectional transformation is. And here I should confess that I'm giving you a very partisan view. I'm talking to you about the kind of bidirectional transformations that I typically work on. Okay? And there are, there are others. Um, but again, this is a topic we could have had a whole course on, and instead we've got one lecture. So this is how it is. Okay. So a bidirectional transformation has two jobs. One thing it has to be able to do on demand is to check whether given models are consistent um, according to some appropriate model, some appropriate definition of consistency, which is embodied in the transformation. Okay, so the job of writing the transformation involves specifying what it means for models to be consistent. And the second job is to say, supposing they're not consistent, um, now please, you should be able to ask it, um, change one of them to restore consistency, on the assumption that the others are, auth are authoritative and must not be changed. Okay. And this is where we get, in the simplest possible case where there are just two models, this is where the term bidirectional comes from. Because the idea is that if I've got two models, might be a PIM and a PSM, say, um, and we say, oh dear, they're not consistent, I should be able to say either, please keep the PIM fixed and modify the PSM to bring the models back into consistency, or please keep the PSM fixed and modify the PIM to bring these things back into consistency. Because depending on the nature of the inconsistency in the situation, either of those things might be what you want to do. Now, you could, you're immediately going to say, but don't you sometimes also want to modify both of them? Um, and the answer is yes, but we're not going to talk about that, th about that today. Now, an interesting thing to notice is that you could have separate programs doing these jobs. So we could just write a Java program that took two models or however many models and returned you a boolean, say true if they're consistent and false if not. And then you could have a completely separate Java program that took two models and 
um, if they weren't consistent, um, returned you a new version of the left-hand one that is consistent with the right-hand one. And then you could have a third Java program that did the same the other way around, modifying the other model. Okay. But the thing is, those programs would have a lot in common, and they would change together, and they would duplicate a lot of information. And so this motivates the idea of having special purpose languages um, that are specially adapted to writing bidirectional transformations, so that they will allow you um, to, for example, just express what it is to be consistent once. Um, and this is, this is active research. We, we, we don't have really good books languages yet. Let's start with a simpler example than the PIM, PSM example we've been talking about so far. Um, suppose your system is defined by a UML class diagram and you want its state or some of its state persisted in a relational database. And what you'd like is not to have to maintain the schema of your RDBMS manually. So you'd like to say something like, well, if we, have a new, if we invent a new persistent class and we record that in the UML class diagram, um, then I would like to be able to press a button and have a new table added automatically in my RDBMS schema. Um, and if I, I don't know, rename a column on the RDBMS side, then I would like to automatically rename the corresponding attribute on the UML side. And so we would like to be able to describe um, what it means for the class diagram and the schema to be consistent um, just once um, and also to encode whatever information we want to specify about how consistency should be restored when there's a choice of how to restore consistency. Um, and then we'd like to express that in one artifact which would be the bidirectional transformation. I've been talking so far about a state-based relational approach to bidirectional transformations. So the underlying assumptions are that we are going to work on, let's say for now, just two models, a pair of models. Drawn from a pair of model spaces, and here we really just basically mean sets of models that are defined by metamodels. And there's a notion of consistency, and what that means mathematically is just that there's a relation on pairs of models just specifies what it is for them to be in sync. So if I give you, um, uh, say, a, a, a class diagram and a schema, um, the relation that that pair will be in, in the relation if and only if that class model is consistent with that schema. Okay. So there's an answer to the question, are these things consistent? Um, we'll assume, for today's purposes, that all that matters is the current state of the model, so we're not going to make use of any information about how the models got to that state. We assume we don't have access to things like edit traces that would say, well, what did the user change in order to bring the model to that state? And we also assume that we're not going to store any kind of trace link information, so no information about how parts of models are related. Um, and we're going to assume, as I already said, that an application of consistency restoration changes only one model. Okay. So this is quite a simple model of, of bidirectional transformations, um, but it's quite powerful. Um, it's enough to model the OMG standard bidirectional language QBTR, um, and it's enough to give us lots of, lots of, of interesting issues. So what is this standard language? So the OMG's Queries, Views and Transformations standard, QVT, um, actually defines not one but three model transformation languages. Um, QVTO is an imperative unidirectional language. QVTR um, is the declarative bidirectional language. And QVT core is a kind of odd thing. Um, it's a lower level bidirectional language, and its intention was to serve as the target of translation from QVTR. Actually, it turns out, and I wrote the paper, that's a reference to it, um, that it's not expressive enough for that, um, which is a bit sad. Um, but this is kind of a bit indicati indicative. So although these are supposedly standard languages, um, none of them have become very popular, partly because um, there were not, um, there wasn't a sufficiently well-defined definition of what the languages and their meanings were supposed to be. Um, and although there was um, a, a useful tool, it wasn't tied sufficiently closely to the standard. Um, and so it's been really quite difficult for people to adopt these languages in any meaningful way. So there's, there's work ongoing still. Um, but it may be that this turns out to be a bit of a cul-de-sac for bidirectional transformations. We'll see. A QVTR transformation T 
is defined in terms of two, I'm going to say two from now on, although it can actually be more than two, uh, metamodels, um, which define the languages that the transformation is going to work on. So we'll say M and N. And it comprises um, relations which are connected by when and where clauses. And I don't expect you to know much about this. I'll give you an example on the next slide. But don't worry if you don't understand the details of a QBTR transformation. I just want you to have seen, s seen them. What I do want you to remember um, is that it has two modes um, in which you can run it, corresponding to those two tasks that I specified for bidirectional transformations a moment ago. So you can run a QBTR transformation. So the same artifact can be run in two ways. So you can run it in check-only mode, in which case what it does is to just to check whether the given models are consistent according to the transformation and return true or false. Or you can run the very same transformation in enforce mode, in which case it changes one of the models. It changes a specified one of the models depending on which direction you choose to run it in. And so we've got one artifact which can be run in three ways corresponding to those hypothetical three different Java programs that I mentioned before, but there's only one of it. There's only one transformation. And here's an example. This example is actually taken from the spec. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, um, but you can see that um, we've got two um, domains in this relation class to table, um, and we're going to specify something about um, a class. We're going to do things like we're going to name the class by calling it CN, um, and then we're going to name the table that should correspond to it in an appropriate sense, and the naming there is also going to use the same variable CN that we that was the name of the class, do you see? And so that's the kind of thing that's going to specify the connection between a class and a table which will be deemed to correspond to that class. Roughly speaking, the when clause says um, that this consistency relationship between a class C and a table T only has to hold if the package in which C is, P, is um, related to the schema S of the table in a way which is specified somewhere else in a different relation package to schema. And then the WHERE clause says, um, oh, and also, by the way, um, C won't count as being correctly related to T unless it's also the case um, that this other relation attribute to column holds between it. And essentially that gives you a, lay a way of kind of structuring the different aspects of the, of the consistency relation to s so that you don't have to say in, in one kind of big chunk of code both the things that you want to specify about how the, the names of the class and table should be related and also everything you want to say about how the package and the schema are related and everything you want to say about the attribute and, um, and the column are related. There's a lot more I could say, but I won't. Okay. So what's good about QBTR? Um, well, it does in fact allow you to express what consistency means and how it should be restored, or at least something about how it should be restored, in one text, which as I said before is a convenient thing to be able to do. Um, and it's well adapted to talk about models that are in languages defined using MOF, for example, UML, but also maybe your domain-specific language if you're defining your domain-specific language in terms of MOF. Um, and the basic relation construct um, is quite natural. Um, it um, has quite a... you can probably work out even from the example what it's supposed to mean. Um, and that works quite well and people find that quite easy to understand. Um, in passing, notice, yes, of course, it can be seen as a domain-specific language for, for what? For expressing bidirectional transformations. Um, and just as we were talking the other day about um, the possibility of having two different concrete syntaxes for the same language, that's the case for QVTR. I just showed you some textual syntax for QVTR, but QVTR also has a graphical concrete syntax. Um, now, in effect, nobody ever uses it, but it's there. However, um, I said that it hadn't been widely adopted, and here are some of the reasons why. Um, there's a lack of available tools. There's still um, no tool that really implements QVTR, um, and there are quite good reasons for that, because the language um, has some quite interesting semantic corners. Um, when and where clauses, I think I'm willing to claim today, are probably not very good structuring mechanisms. Um, I did some research work a while back um, with Julian Bradfield making an analogy between when and where clauses and maximal and minimal fixed points in a, in a, a certain um, logic. 
called the modal mu calculus, which are notoriously hard to understand when they start nesting. Um, and that actually, to my mind, sheds quite a lot of light on why, when and where clauses, unlike the basic relation idea, are not really very easy to use. Um, people find it very difficult to understand for sure what they've said um, in that situation. Um, the standard itself is not that clear. Um, and whereas in a, in a modelling language like UML for informal use, um, you can argue that it doesn't really matter very much if there's a lack of clarity because people can use UML in the way they intended to um, and they can agree between themselves as a human communication matter exactly what they want it to use, um, what they want it to mean. Um, that's already a slightly dodgy argument for UML because it um, makes it difficult to swap models between tools and to implement tools that work on UML models, and I've already had something to say about that. Um, but all of those problems bite you much harder in a specification of a transformation language because a transformation is just a program and you better know what, what you, and you really want to know what the program will do, not just roughly what it will do. Okay, You don't want to have to agree as a matter of human communication what your program is going to do. So yeah, um, interesting idea, hasn't taken over the world. There are probably good reasons why it hasn't taken over the world. But maybe some other bidirectional language may do so in future. Here is one of the better existing bidirectional languages, um, and there are some quite impressive tools using these, using triple graph grammars. Um, I'm not going to say very much about these, but I just want you to have seen an example of something other than QVTR for describing bidirectional transformations. Um, so in triple graph grammars, um, you define your bidirectional transformation using a collection of what are called triple rules. Um, and the triple rules define a language of what are called integrated triple graphs, which are um, triples, SCT, where the S and the T are the models you're interested in, and the models here are represented as graphs, so S and T are graphs and you want them to be consistent. And the C is a correspondence graph, and that links up bits of S and T um, in a way to show, as the name suggests, what corresponds to what. Um, and the idea is that SCT is in this family of integrated triple graphs if and only if S and T are consistent. Um, and then you have a bunch of rules that specify how you build up more complicated integrated triple graphs from simpler ones, um, and this is qu quite well tool supported, and I'm really going to resist the temptation to try to explain this in any more detail. However, there are good tool supports for TGGs. There's a well-developed underlying theory, um, and the graphical notations turn out to be very good for expressing consistency between models that have a pretty close structural similarity anyway. Okay, So if you've got, for example, um, I don't know, two different formats for addresses in your address book, um, but pretty similar underlying notions of what it is to be an address, then TGGs turn out to be really quite a useful way of expressing the kind of consistency and how to restore it. On the other hand, if that's not the case, if the graphs are not very similar structurally, then it turns out to be very difficult to write a correct TGG for expressing it, so much so that you probably don't really want to do it that way. Um, and then there's a bunch of technical issues with them. Um, it turns out to be quite difficult to handle deleting elements. Um, it turns out to be quite a knotty problem to handle situations in which we want to specify when a rule should not be allowed to apply. These are called negative application conditions. Don't worry about it. Um, and I have come to think over the years that although these clearly have strengths and there are some quite impressive success stories, it may be that they can't really sensibly be pushed much further than the existing success stories. In other words, I think TGDs might actually be a, a now quite well explored dead end uh, that are not going to help us to revolutionise software development in the way that I would like us to do. This is now a bit of a clunk, but I do want to um, make sure that you understand that bidirectional transformations do not have to be bijective, um, because people often get confused by this. So there is an important special case where you might want to maintain consistency where the consistency relation was bijective. In other words, you might want to say for each model on one side there is a unique, that's the exclamation mark, model on the other side which is consistent with it. 
In other words, if I give you one model, you can completely determine what the other model must be in order to be consistent with it. Um, now, if that holds, then the bidirectional transformation is bijective, and it follows that there is a pair of inverse functions um, that will just generate one from the other. So I can generate an n from an m, and I can generate an m from an n, um, and if I apply one and then the other, I'll get back exactly where I started, um, whichever side I started on. Okay, so this is a very nice and easy situation to be in. It's not sufficiently general for real applications in, in model-driven development. One reason is because it follows from this that the models are, if you think about it, that the two models who, that are bijectively related here are actually embodying exactly the same information. Okay, And if they're embodying exactly the same information, then there is a question about why you have both of them in the first place. Because the ordinary situation is that each of each model will have some information in it that is not in the other model and that's probably why the model exists in the first place um, and so you can think for example um, about a situation where you might want to transform a full UML model that includes dynamic diagrams to an RDBMS schema um, well the content of the dynamic diagrams the sequence diagrams are completely irrelevant to what's in the schema and so, for example, a change to the dynamic diagrams that doesn't change the class diagram is never going to break consistency. Um, and if something, um, if you tried to generate the full UML model from an RDBMS schema, you've got no hope, really, of generating interesting dynamic diagrams from the schema because the information just isn't there in the schema to do it. Okay. As I started to indicate a few minutes ago, there will often be a genuine choice about how to resolve inconsistencies because there will be more than one model on one side which is consistent with the model you've got on the other side. And so that choice of different models that are all of them equally consistent with the, with the model you're trying to restore consistency with needs to be somehow embodied in the bidirectional transformation. In other words, the books programmer needs a way to make that choice. Books is short for bidirectional transformation, by the way, I don't think I've said that. Um, Here's an example that I'm not going to labour too much, but suppose you're in a situation where you've got a UML model where there's a class diagram and some state diagrams, um, and you've also got a test set, and you're trying to maintain a consistency relationship between this UML model and the test set, which says that for every class that has a state diagram, there should be um, a test set, there should be a class, a, a, a test class in your set of JUnit tests, say. Um, and now we say, OK, we've deleted one of these test sets. Um, so now there's a class it, with a state diagram on the UML side um, that doesn't have an appropriate test set, but we're supposed to restore consistency by modifying the UML. Okay. So what should we do? Well, we, we might delete the whole class. Okay. Um, but alternatively, we might leave the class there and just delete its state diagram. Okay, Either of those two fixes would restore consistency. Which is better? Well, maybe somebody can specify at the time when you're discussing consistency and saying, well, how should it be restored? Um, or maybe it needs to be decided at runtime somehow. Um, and there are lots of very interesting issues there. What kinds of properties would we expect a well-behaved bidirectional transformation to have, um, it's fairly straightforward to agree that it should have th these two properties, correctness and Hippocraticness. Um, correctness basically just says if the um, bidirectional transformation restores consistency, then afterwards the models should actually be consistent. Um, now that may sound completely tautological, but remember that we were supposed to be able to run our bidirectional transformation in either checking mode or enforcing mode. And so it's possible for that not to hold. You could imagine um, a bidirectional transformation that claimed to restore consistency, but actually gave you a result that still wasn't consistent according to its own consistency checking. Okay, that would be bad. Okay, so we want the transformation to be correct in the sense that um, it really does restore consistency when it claims to have done so. Um, and it's also usually relatively easy to get to, to get agreement that um, if you give to a bidirectional transformations consistency rest restoration function um, two models which according to its own consistency checking are already consistent 
then it doesn't have a good reason for modifying either of the models, okay? And so it shouldn't. So I coined this term Hippocratic, um, basically saying first do no harm, okay? It shouldn't modify the models if there's no need to do so. Beyond that, um, agreeing what properties a bidirectional transformation should have um, gets surprisingly hard because it's quite easy to write down properties that you would like to have um, and then find that you can't have them all. Um, and some of them are informally desirable, um, but they're very hard to make precise. Um, and these things have implications for language design. If you're trying to design a language in which to express bidirectional transformations, um, one of the things you might want from that language is that it's only possible to express bidirectional transformations that have whatever good properties you've agreed on. Um, but if it's difficult to agree the properties, it's also difficult to do the, lang do the language design. Um, and I will resist the temptation to say any more about this slide right then. You can read the details. So, in summary, how models are used is very much intertwined with how they are related um, to one another and also related to the code that's going to support running the system in the end um, and with what you want to do with them with the use of tools. Um, so the OMG's MDA approach aimed to use model transformations to automate a lot of software development um, but it wasn't very successful as originally envisaged and one of the reasons um, was that it was trying to um, to work on languages that were too big and complex and it seems much more likely to work in the context where we're using much simpler domain specific languages and another reason was because it um, was being put together before we understood uh, even as much as we do today about um, what we need from bidirectional transformations in order to maintain consistency between models um, and this is a very active field. <coughs>